So welcome to the latest edition of our Virtual Bridge sessions. And today I'm I'm I'm, I'm truly excited to be joined by Kevin Brosnan. Yay! Who, <laughs> who genuinely, I have a lot of time for you, Kevin. Like, um, I have known you for a few years. But, you know, everyone that meets you says nice things about you, especially your students, which I feel is really the key to, to any true sense of success for any educator. So <laughs> I'm, I'm intrigued to learn a bit more about what you do. Uh, and today you're going to be sharing with us your, your views on that online teaching and so i'm I, i've got my notebook ready so without further ado over to okay. you okay uh well uh thank you kenji you're you're far far too gracious uh with your uh introduction and your compliments but uh, thank you anyway um can i just double check uh that, that people can see my my powerpoint slide good good i've got three screens um, which is great for efficiency, but it's also great for losing things. Um, so it's good to know that uh, people can can see. So um, uh, I'm Kevin Brosnan, and as Kenji has just said, I'm the program director for the TQFE program at the University of Stirling. And what I wanted to talk about uh, this morning was the idea of convivial learning environments, um, and uh, and just how we try and reflect that idea in what we do at Stirling and have done for a number of years um, and how important, even more important it's become uh, as a consequence of lockdown and the move to uh, online learning. And um, so uh, let me just, um, so what I wanted to do uh, was, um, have a look at what we mean by convivial. Um, uh, and that word has a particular usage uh, that I'll, 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 I'd like to draw attention to. Then I would like to move us on and give some thought to the idea of professional learning and professional learning communities. Um, that's perhaps all a wee bit abstract and high level. Uh, and as educators, I guess, you know, we're keen to look at ways in which we can do things differently, how we can implement ideas. So then I want to move on and have a look at some models, uh, frameworks of online learning and how we can use those models to support convivial learning environments. And uh, then share with you some simple examples from TQFE. And then as Kenji has just said, um, open up um, the, the, the opportunity for a uh, question and answer and discussion. And um, so uh, time is relatively tight. So, um, so the word convivial, um, I, um, I did my PhD at Lancaster University quite a number of years ago, and, and it was all a cunning plan. The whole PhD project was a cunning plan so that I could finish with these words from Ivan Illich. The whole three, four, five years of my PhD culminated in these words from Ivan Illich, um, where he talks about conviviality and he talks about it as personal interdependence, and how it is a fundamental ethical value. And it goes on and it just tries to clarify that in English usage, the word convivial often is associated with parties and it's with topsy jolliness as he puts it. Uh, and he means it's to, uh, something much more profound than that. It, it is about how we relate to each other in constructive ways. Um, and uh, that to me was really, really important in the work that I was doing, that learning and development is about connectedness between people, connectedness that supports people develop, um, that offers opportunities also to challenge each other, but in constructive ways. So uh, that word uh, was, was really significant to me in the way that he was using it. And I thought it spoke a lot to what we were trying to do as educators um, in physical face-to-face -face environments, but also increasingly in online environments. So um, I've been thinking about that word uh, ever since. Um, and um, it then moved me on to thinking about what we mean by professional learning and professional learning communities. Um, and I know there are, there are more definitions of professional learning uh, than you can, to put it crudely, shake a stick at. Um, but for me, professional learning, I thought I think about it in three different ways. Um, one is the context. Um, and professional learning often deals or is embedded in contexts that are very, very complex, where, and apologies for my little image here, it may not be terribly clear, but 
uh, in professional context, often we're dealing with wicked problems. We're dealing with problems that don't have a clear definition. There's, there's often a disagreement about what the problem is. There are multiple viewpoints about those problems and there's, there's no simple solution. Uh, and in fact, often these issues evolve over time and we don't have a simple solution ever. So professional learning is dealing with those sorts of complex, messy, ambiguous contexts. The second thing is professional learning is about judgment. Uh, there's no simple algorithm in how we deal with these contexts and the problems that we come across. If there was a simple algorithm, then we would have an app to deal with it, but we don't. We need people, we need lecturers in colleges to make good professional judgments. And uh, that means that they draw upon their experience, they draw upon their knowledge, they draw upon a wide range of different resources in different ways on different occasions to deal with these sorts of problems. And then I think a third key issue about professional learning and professional work is autonomy. Um, now there's a limit, uh, we can't go off and do exactly what we wish, but in terms of working as a professional, uh, we often have a degree of autonomy, a degree of self-direction um, that is distinguished from other types of contexts. Now, I'm not suggesting that everything that we do as professionals reflects these three different aspects, that there will be plenty of routine uh, issues that we have to deal with. Um, but working in, in a professional uh, manner means that we will increasingly have to deal with these messy contexts, we have to use judgment, and we have a degree of autonomy. So that is, um, a key part of the TQFE course, it's reflecting that kind of uh, thinking about being a professional and professional learning. And um, now, as I said at the beginning, you know, uh, Illich's idea of conviviality and Thomas Aquinas and then ideas about professional learning, these are all perhaps interesting, I find them interesting, but they're quite high level, quite abstract ideas. But as educators, we, we, we're generally quite practical people, I think. We want to do things and we want to make things better. So I guess the key question is, well, what can I do with these ideas? How can I use them and apply them to my day-to-day -day teaching and professional practice? And this is where I think models uh, and frameworks can be useful, potentially can be useful. Now, there's a, there's a number of challenges with models and frameworks. One, there's a lot of them. Um, I was just reading a paper recently published in 2018 in the British Journal of Educational Technology, and the authors there, uh, their paper was a review of 21 different models, frameworks um, around the design of technology enhanced learning, 21 models. That didn't include the ones that they had excluded uh, for their review. So there's a lot to choose from. Uh, and of course, people will throw their hands up and say, well, in the face of so much choice, I can't make a choice, which is absolutely understandable. I would suggest um, that um, one model uh, that, that, that I found quite useful and has guided our thinking on TQFE is the, the Jilly Salmon model. Now, there are caveats. Um, it's not a universal solution to every problem. Of course, it isn't. It has its weaknesses um, and you'll encounter those weaknesses if you try and push this model beyond its original intended use. Um, and it needs work. We as professionals need to work to make this model, this framework work for us in our particular teaching and learning situations. But I think it's got uh, a number of uh, advantages. One, it's simple, uh, five, five stages. I, I can remember five stages. Um, so I've got a fighting chance of being able to keep using this model effectively. Secondly, uh, it's based on quite extensive uh, practical and empirical research. Dilly Salmon has got quite a history, uh, originally with the Open University of, of online teaching and learning. And so she's got a, a quite a, an established base of knowledge to draw upon and, and, and this reflects um, that base of knowledge. And then thirdly, um, and this is something peculiar to me, it, it passes what I call the Goldilocks test. Um, now, I use the Goldilocks test quite a lot. Um, um, it's not to do with porridge in this case, um, but 
for me, a good framework needs to provide structure. But if it provides too much structure, it constrains and restricts me. If it provides too little structure, then it doesn't help guide my thinking. And I'm, and I'm left you know, with this blank sheet of paper kind of phenomena. So we need something that's kind of in between those two extremes. And, and I think this model kind of passes that test. It's not too extreme. It provides enough structure, but equally it provides enough flexibility that I can use it and adapt it to my particular needs. And it's not the only model that we use. I mentioned 21. I'm not going to bore you uh, going through 21 different models. But two other models that, that we have made quite a lot of use of uh, in, in thinking about how we structure professional learning on TQFE. One is the, the Garrison and Anderson model. It's been around for quite a while and it, it stood the test of time their community of inquiry model. Um, and they, they talk about social presence and cognitive presence and teacher presence. They're emphasizing processes there, processes of interaction, which I think is really important. Um, and then the other model, which was originally proposed with nothing to do with technology enhanced learning or online learning, but that's Etienne Wenger's model where he talks about um, a learning architecture to support communities of practice. Um, and I think there are some ideas in there which again are helpful to draw upon. But um, what I'll do for the remainder of this presentation is I'll focus on the, the Jilly Salmon model and just try and elaborate a little bit further different aspects of it and how we've tried to reflect those different aspects uh, in the, the TQFE course. So now when I was putting the presentation together, I got to this point and I thought, oh no, this it's beginning to look like a bit of an advertising and a marketing and a sales pitch for TQFE at Sterling. And please, it's not meant to be that. It, it, it is meant, I'm offering this up as a method of sharing knowledge, open, being open to criticism, but most importantly, being open to an opportunity to rethink what we're doing and develop it. And, and ultimately, you know, I think we have all of the TQFE providers in Scotland uh, we do work together and we are trying to support uh, an aspect of the development for the sector. And so I think being transparent about what we do in our courses and looking for opportunities to change and develop them is really important. So that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to um, emphasize as part of uh, this part of the, the presentation. So the first step in Jilly Salmon's model, uh, step number one is access and motivation. Now, this has always been important to us in how we run TQFA at Sterling. It's become even more important uh, as a consequence of the move to online and distance learning. Um, we, uh, I stretch the university regulations to their limit um, because they can be quite rigid. Uh, and one way in which I stretch them is I, I start the course informally before the formal start date because the time frame for the course is tight. And we really need people to be up and running and hitting the ground running from day one. So we start with a pre-course orientation. And traditionally, we've done that in June, in the early part of the summer. And we try and use that uh, for a variety of purposes. A key issue is we ask for input from previous students. Uh, these are people who have seen the course from the inside, um, who can talk from an insider's perspective. Um, and we we vacate the room either physically or digitally to give those people the opportunity to speak frankly and openly about positives and negatives. Um, we also give our new to be students access to a pre-course website uh, and that reflects the tools and the resources that they're going to be using on the course. So we're trying to give them a feel of what it will be like to be a student using these tools and resources. And then thirdly, we use that opportunity to help people uh, with developmental tasks, uh, particularly to do with academic literacies, because we're conscious that we have a broad spectrum of people, some of whom academic writing and academic reading is quite new, uh, certainly at, at levels nine and 11. And so we provide opportunity uh, through the, the, the pre-course orientation to help people develop or begin to develop those required academic literacies. It's, it's kind of 
almost an apprenticeship model. Here's how we work on TQFE at Sterling. These are some of the skills and uh, techniques that you'll need to use. We then move on to the induction process, and that's become really important uh, as a consequence of the move to online. And um, so we introduce our students to our virtual learning environment, Canvas. We provide quite an extensive range of activities and resources for them to work their way through, explore via a kind of a web quest. And then we check on how they're doing or how they have done through a simple quiz survey. And I think a really key element of that is the individualized follow-up. Uh, we don't just simply ask them to submit their quiz and then it goes nowhere. Um, we check what their responses are and where people are indicating that they don't feel confident about a particular aspect of our online learning environment, we follow that up and we offer them an opportunity to discuss that with us. Uh, it's a really complex architecture. We have multiple systems. Uh, even myself and colleagues who've worked at Sterling for a number of years, we get lost in this architecture. And so for our new students coming in, who often are coming from an environment where they have a different uh, email system, a different virtual learning environment, whatever it might be, switching to this architecture can be really, really challenging. Um, I liken it to Christopher Columbus sailing across the Atlantic uh, and coming across a new continent. Joining the TQFE course at Sterling or elsewhere is almost like traveling to a new continent. Uh, there's a whole range of different flora and fauna that, that people are going to have to get used to. So the induction process is, is really, really important. And, uh, you know, Jilly Salmon emphasizes this as part of access and motivation, that we shouldn't make assumptions about the uh, environment that our students are working in, the tools that they have. And we've seen many occasions where people are trying to access the course on a mobile phone. And, you know, they're, they're really setting themselves up to fail because the, the, the degree of interaction that we require from them just can't be supported easily on a mobile phone. Um, so uh, access and motivation is key. It, it, and the time there, I, I, I suggest it's an investment. It's not a cost, it's an investment. And if we invest time there, then we can save ourselves an awful lot of difficulty later on. The second step in Salmon's model is online socialization. And we spend a lot of time and effort supporting this because, as I said at the beginning, conviviality is about interconnectedness, it's about relatedness. Uh, and so we need opportunities for people to reveal that they are people, that they, they have a biography, they have a history, they have a family, they, they have a life outside of TQFE. One way in which we do this, and, and it's proved to be really successful, is we ask each of our students to use a slide, a simple slide, and put together their, their learner, their teacher biography, their journey into teaching. And they're asked to share these via an online discussion area, uh, and then that prompts for further discussion. And some of the discussions that we've had around these artifacts has been really rich, really deep, and it gives us, as teachers on the course, a deeper insight into our students. And equally, we share our journeys into teaching with our students, so they get a deeper insight into us and how we've got to where we are. And um, so the online socialization is a, it's an ongoing part of the process, but we've put a lot of effort into getting it kick-started through uh, uh, processes like this, the, the, the sharing of this, uh, my journey into teaching slide. Um, the next level that I'll focus on, uh, there is a level three, which I've skipped over, but uh, I wanted to move us on to level four, which is knowledge construction in Salmon's model. And uh, Kenji has direct experience of this because he joined us uh, with our pre-service students. Um, and one of the knowledge construction activities that we ask them to engage in is they work in small groups and they are given a design brief. They have to design a wiki page. Some of them have never heard of wiki and never designed a wiki page. And they're uh, asked to produce a, a series of resources that they can share with their colleagues. And we give them one uh, part of one day to do that. Uh, they start the day in a bit of a panic and think this is utterly impossible. Um, but uh, every year, 
our students deliver. And they produce a shared resource that's not only a benefit to them and their small working group, but it's a benefit to the entire course. And through those, those shared artifacts, they themselves, the community has developed a resource that's useful to the entire community. Uh, so we're adopting a bottom up approach rather than trying to adopt a top down approach, which we have in the past, and we try and transmit a body of knowledge to our students. In the past, surprise, surprise, it just didn't work. Um, a bottom up approach, a crowdsourcing approach, encourages them to be far more active, gives them far more flexibility, and it leaves them with the satisfaction of having produced a resource that, as I say, is a benefit to the community as a whole. And the feedback that we get generally, it's not universal, but generally people are really positive um, about that process and how it's helped them develop their own knowledge. And, and then finally, um, the, the, the fifth level in Jilly Salmon's model, and I think this is a really important one, um, she talks about development and looking outwards um, from a, a course, a particular uh, learning environment, uh, and looking to the broader professional community. Uh, and for me, uh, helping people achieve the TQFE qualification is important, but what's really important is what they then do with that qualification. How do they take that learning, that experience, take it into the broader community and change perhaps their own practice, perhaps encourage change in practice, with their colleagues. And um, myself, uh, Christine Calder at uh, Dundee and Angus College and Patrick O'Donnell at Perth College have been working for some time uh, trying to develop what we've referred to as CAIRN, the, the College's Action Inquiry and Research Network. Uh, and Christine has put together the first version of the CAIRN journal as a WordPress um, uh, blog. Uh, and I've, I've given you a screenshot here, uh, and I appreciate you won't be able to see the detail, but I've just highlighted three articles uh, that appear in this first edition of the Cairn Journal. And all of those three articles have come from TQFE assignments here at Stirling. Um, I thought they were particularly good pieces of work. They're about teaching innovations. And so I encouraged each of these uh, ex TQFE students to take that work, revise it slightly, edit it slightly, and put it forward uh, for publication here. Um, and it's, I think each of them has done a fantastic job. It's a piece of work that deserves a wider audience and which can help support the development of others in the sector. So uh, in a way for me, that's, that's kind of the acid test of what we're doing on TQFE. Are we encouraging and supporting our students to make that wider, broader uh, contribution to the sector? So uh, I'm conscious time is moving on. Uh, we're not far off 11.30. Um, I'll come to a halt there in terms of presentation. And if anybody's got any observations, thoughts, comments, questions, uh, then I'm happy to try and respond to those. Excellent, Kevin. Um, I'm sure there's going to be more than a few questions. I'm just going to start off with one of my own. I'm, I'm really interested in your induction process. And I know that at Stirling, you, you have upwards of 40 students joining uh, at, at the beginning of term. And, and you're mentioning taking them through an online induction process, giving them an example of what to expect in the course itself, but also that individual follow up. What, what kind of overhead does that involve? Um, you know, how much time does it take? Yeah, well, you know, initially it takes a lot of time. Um, but if it's if it's well designed, then I think it becomes sustainable over time. And and we can we can marry, you know, the, 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 the two E's um, effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, and I know sometimes, you know, efficiency gets gets highlighted and it often drives out effectiveness. But I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. So with careful thinking, careful design, then we can sustain it. We can make it efficient, but also make it effective. Um, so you're right. Um, I think there is much more uh, effort in the design process and in the initial implementation. But if we get, get it right, we have to tweak it and revise it. But we can have a model 
that then serves us very well. Okay. Um, does anyone else have a question for Kevin? Oh, Phil. Yes, a quick question, and then I'll need to duck out. I've got another meeting at half past, I'm afraid. Um, hi, Kevin. Uh, Phil Stollier. Um, I am Director of Student Experience down at Dumfries and Galloway. Um, we were actually just, you know, spent about an hour and a half. We're going through a real kind of uh, process of looking at our um, induction processes and how we, I'm really interested in that bit about how we prepare students for embarking on their course before day one. Um, so what I was interested in was a, a kind of, I suppose, a, a sticking point we came to yesterday. At that um, access and motivation stage, how do you deal with kind of student queries? So, you know, they're, they're struggling to get onto the, the pre-course website or they're struggling with the de 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 developmental tasks. What, what process do you have for actually, you know, responding to and, you know, answering those queries? Because what we were discussing yesterday is they have queries about such a broad range of programmes and historically those queries yeah. all went to individual silos and departments. But I'm also conscious that we need to respond to things quickly and efficiently. Yeah. So I'd just be interested in how you manage that. Yeah, well, um, I mean, our student numbers are not huge. And um, so we have, you know, just over 50 on the in-service course. 30 on the pre-service course and um, so they're not tiny but they're not huge and it's the kind of number where we can still respond as on a program team level and so during that uh, initial uh, pre-course period uh, that previously used to run from June through to September our main forms of contact um, would be personal emails uh, and telephone calls and um, so you know, it's, it is relatively labor intensive. I, I accept that, you know, but my thinking is, you know, if we, can, if we can invest the time at that point, the chances are we're saving ourselves and our students a lot of time and difficulty during the course and hopefully enhancing the student experience. So I'm afraid I, I haven't got a, a simple answer uh, to your question, Phil, but it's one of these situations where I think we've got to bite the bullet and accept that certain parts of the educational process are time consuming and do require quite a lot of personal interaction, but they do pay benefits. Okay, excellent. No, I, I, I totally agree, you know, and certainly our side of things, that's something I'm really keen. I think that's becoming vital. I think historically, yeah. what I'm picking up on is students applied and then they waited until day one and there was very little information other than yeah. here's your funding, yeah. here's your bursary yeah. and here's your, and it's not a great experience. So, you yeah. know, I really like the model and then yeah. kind of focusing yeah. on that access and motivation stage. Yeah. So. And I, I mean, I do a lot to try and encourage people. I mean, an awful lot. Um, but equally, I want people to have the opportunity to kind of say, you know what, having gone through this orientation process, I now realize this isn't the right course for me. And that's, in my mind, that's a good outcome. Uh, not that I want to drive people away, I don't, but I want to make sure people are on the right course for them. Um, yeah. And I see that orientation process as being, you know, really in, a vital part of that. Yeah, I would agree. Absolutely. Thanks for that. Really interesting. Right. I'll need to duck out here now, but okay. thanks very much. Thanks. Okay, so we have time for uh, one last question um, just before we end this recorded part of this session. Does anyone have a question for Kevin? I'm going to take advantage then <laughs> of the time slot. Um, Kevin, um, I'm, I'm interested in that. Uh, when we talk about convi convivial um, environments, there is that aspect of bringing students together to, to foster that sense of community between themselves. And in, in this time of a, a more distance-based approach, that can be quite challenging. So within that framework, how would you foster that sense of community between students? Yeah, well, uh, I think in one of the previous presentations, there was it Ailey, Ailey McPherson from UHI, uh, and Ailey uh, touched on the uh, balance between synchronous and asynchronous activity. Uh, and we've made, uh, we've always made an awful lot of use of asynchronous activity, but this year we're making a lot of use of synchronous. Uh, and some of our colleagues at the university have said, you know, we've got to be careful about how we use the phrase face to face, because you can have face to face, just as we are doing here online. Uh, it's different. Um, so we've put a lot of effort into synchronous activities where we split people up into small groups, we mix those groups, 
Uh, and we have low risk, low intensity activities to begin with. And some of our students have spotted it. You know, they've said, look, this activity isn't really about what you said it's about. It's about getting us talking to each other. It's about getting us social. And I have to rub my chin and say, yep, I'll hold my hand up. You've got me. You know, it, it's almost like a, a Trojan horse pedagogy. We introduce a simple task, but within the Trojan horse, there's, there's something else hidden. And it is that social interaction. And, you know, one of the things I didn't mention as part of my presentation is just how important trust is in a professional convivial learning environment. And trust doesn't come easy. Um, it requires an awful lot of effort, thinking about the, the design of the framework, thinking of the design of the environment, and really encouraging people to open up and develop and build trust with each other. That's brilliant. And unfortunately, that's all we have time for in this recorded part of the Virtual Bridge session. So thanks for everyone who's joined us. And Kevin, I trust you've had an excellent experience sharing with us. <laughs> no pun intended. I know, don't give up the day job, <laughs> but it was an excellent experience. Hopefully you'll have some time to uh, join us at some future virtual bridge session, but until then, stay safe.